Hey everyone, it's been a while, but I'm back. I've been away for a little bit. I've been pretty busy with some uh, non-shop related stuff. <gasps> Me and my girlfriend just moved to a new apartment, which has a nice nice guest bedroom and what I'm hoping will be a shiny new uh, industrial craft kind of area. So I don't know if I'd call it a shop, but we'll see where it goes. I've also got a shed that has electricity, which means I can probably do some more outdoorsy shenanigans at home, which will be kind of nice. <laughs> So this new project I'm calling a jeweler's lathe. I'm not sure if this has been done before or if this machine exists. What I'm basically going for is a kind of manual lathe that's sort of constrained and easy to use. Me and my girlfriend used to do sort of silversmithing jewelry stuff and uh, that was a lot of fun. But uh, she doesn't know how to use machines in the new shop and I wanted to make something that we could sort of both use for jewelry making uh, that wasn't sort of big and scary like the south bend in the shop so this is part one of that this is going to be the spindle which i think is a pretty good place to start so how are we going to approach this problem if you think about it a cutting tool does one thing very well and that's converting stock material into chips now we can harness that by telling it where to remove the material to turn into chips from and that's how we get finished parts the procedure I'm going to use to approach this is going to be figuring out the material removal rate from an example cut. If you already know what MRR you want to use, uh, this will sort of be a, a, an extra step. But I don't really know MRRs that well. I just know what the cut I want to take kind of looks like. So with the material removal rate, we can correlate that to how much power is needed to make that cut to get that material removal rate. And that'll be the spindle power. Uh, from the spindle power, we can calculate what kind of force is going to be applied that resists that power. So how much force goes through the cutting tool into the machine. And then we can determine how the forces from the cut and how the forces from the pulley tension are going to be transferred to our bearings. And from here we can actually choose our bearings. So we're going to have to pick a way of arranging these bearings such that everything is constrained the way we want it to to get sort of optimal cutting out of those bearings. Uh, from that arrangement we can design ourselves a shaft and then from that shaft and those bearings we can design the housing. So my first step is going to be picking a cut that I want. So we know this machine is going to remove material, right? I don't know what MRRs look like. I know in a lot of YouTube videos I watch they'll say what the MRR is, but I can't really visualize it. So I'm going to visualize a cut that I want to be able to take. If you've already got a desired material removal rate in mind, you can actually skip this step. So I want to be able to take a one millimeter cut off of 25 millimeter brass round at 0.05 millimeters per rev and 3000 RPM. So that's a cut I know, it's a cut I've taken before and it's, I would be happy with that as a maximum cut for this machine. It's a fairly small machine, I don't want it to be very dangerous. So I'm going to limit it to something like this and we'll see what we get. So it just so happens that it takes a certain amount of energy to convert a certain amount of material to chips. This is called the specific energy of the cut. Um, so as an example of a specific energy, it takes about one watt of power to remove one cubic millimeter of aluminum per second. And that is the case in turning, drilling, or milling. There are some fringe cases where that doesn't quite apply. So if we're talking grinding, it's going to be something different. Um, if you're using a super dull uh, turning tool and you're, you're just smushing the aluminum off, it's obviously going to take more power. But as a general rule, this applies quite well. So if our spindle is going 3000 RPM and I'm cutting at 0.05 millimeters per revolution, we can calculate how fast the carriage has to move, which turns out to be two and a half millimeters per second. If I'm taking a one millimeter deep cut on a lathe, it means I'm taking two millimeters off the diameter. Because the carriage is moving at two and a half millimeters per second, I can calculate the volume of material I'm removing every second using the volume of a cylinder. So we know that the volume of a cylinder is pi times the square of the radius times length. The volume that I'm removing is going to be the total volume of the stock before the cut minus the volume of the stock after the cut. So if we calculate this through for this example at two and a half millimeters per second, we get 188 and a half millimeters cubed per second for a material removal rate. So we know the material removal rate and we know the specific cutting energy of a given material. That means we can calculate how much energy is needed per second uh, to get that material removal rate. So from our example that we were talking about before and the machine I'm designing right now, 
The specific energy for cutting brass with a sharp tool is 2.3 watt seconds per millimeter cubed. I know that's a total nightmare unit, but it just is what it is. If we go through this calculation, we know 2.3 watt seconds per millimeter cubed times our material removal rate of 188.5 millimeters cubed per second is going to be 433.6 watts, which is 0.58 horsepower. Now it's important to note that this is the horsepower that we need available to us. So if we lose horsepower in the belt or if there's friction in the bearings and we lose horsepower there, that's all going to be upstream of what this number is. So we're actually going to aim for a higher horsepower than that. So now we're going to get into some simplification based on what power actually means. Like I said before, power is expending energy over a certain amount of time. So you can imagine a lot of energy over a little time is going to be a huge amount of power versus a little energy over a long time is going to be less power. Power also happens to be force that is being applied at a certain speed. That's uh, one of Newton's laws. Uh, Newton did all the calculations. He worked it all out. We basically just have to use it. So if we know the surface speed of the cut, which is the stock radius times the RPM, that'll give us a surface speed of 3927 millimeters per second. Uh, if you know your cut well, then you're going to know what the surface speed is, because that's how you would calculate your RPM. So you can just skip ahead to that. Force is equal to power divided by velocity. It's a big simplification, but it's been shown to work fairly well in this situation. So if we take 433.6 watts divided by about 4 meters per second, we get 110 newtons, which is about 25 pounds of force. So one thing I thought was really interesting is that cutting forces actually aren't that huge. Uh, you can imagine holding a 25 pound weight. It's not really that heavy at all. Um, the trick is the rigidity. So now to the, the more complicated part of cutting. There's three basic forces. There's axial force, which is how much force is required to push the tool through the workpiece. There's radial force, which is how much force the workpiece applies to push the tool radially out from the cut. And then the tangential force is how much force is required to hold the cutting tool in place while it's creating a chip. And these can all be summed together using a vector sum to be a resultant force. So unfortunately what we just calculated is the resultant force. That means we don't know what proportions of axial, tangential, and radial forces there are. So the resultant is basically the vector sum of the other three forces. We can't calculate three things while only knowing one. Fortunately from experiments, it's been found out that for a general case in turning, radial is about 80% of the resultant, axial is about 20%, and tangential is about 50%. Those percents don't add up, do they? That's because it's a fancy sum. So what are our forces? We know the resultant force, which is 110 newtons. And then if we multiply by these different percentages, we can approximately get what the radial, axial, and tangential forces are. So it may not look like it, but this is the top of our spindle. You can see, I'm assuming we have two bearings in the front, one bearing in the back. We have a pulley and we have a cutting tool. Uh, this can be simplified as a single rigid body, which I've shown here. And if we isolate that, we can see where the forces are being applied. If you've done any engineering classes before, you'll recognize this as a free body diagram. I'm not going to sit here and solve all these forces on YouTube because that would be super boring. But it's basically six different equations that you're going to end up with. And when you simplify some things and make some assumptions, there's only five things you don't know. So I just made an Excel sheet that solves for the forces. Now, this is where I'm going to diverge a little bit from tradition. Normally, if you're doing a calculation like this, you're going to find out how big the shaft has to be to handle these loads and part of that is picking a material as well. Uh, then you're going to pick bearings that apply to that shaft size. Then you're going to calculate if those bearings are strong enough. <laughs> if they're not, you have to repeat the whole process. It's very iterative. Then you're going to go on to design the shaft and the housing to properly hold on to these bearings. But in this case, the forces that I'm working with are so low, and I already know I'm going to be using a standard taper size, that the bearings are actually super overkill. Based on the calculations above, 608 skateboard bearings would be a good choice. So my calculations got me this far. They got me sort of a rough outline of what I want the shaft to look like. I've got a needle bearing on the back just because it's something I've always wanted to try. And I've got two 6004 ball bearings in the front. Um, 
I haven't figured out the work holding yet, but I think it's going to be fairly straightforward. And you can see the distances I've got there too, so it's a fairly small spindle. There's different layouts that I could have used. Um, you always want one set of bearings to locate the shaft axially, and you want the other set of bearings to be able to slide freely axially. I was a little skeptical about this when I was first learning about this sort of design approach, but it is true that shafts do expand under heat. Even though you're only expanding a couple of microns, if you expand a couple of microns into something that's super rigid, you can generate really big forces and of course you can ruin your bearings and stuff. Uh, one other thing is we also want to preload one set of bearings, and that's going to be applying a load that takes up the extra clearance in the bearings. I'm hoping to put out a video on bearings soon that goes into a lot more detail on all this, but for now, uh, I basically settled on the second layout here. So, the big advantage to this setup is that it's a single machining layout for the shaft and the housing. And also, I'm using a single nut to preload everything. So by now, you'll have noticed uh, I'm using deep groove ball bearings instead of angular contact bearings. Angular contact bearings are basically deep groove ball bearings that are biased in one direction to be able to take axial forces that are a lot higher. I ran the numbers on both angular contact and deep groove ball bearings, and when you're cutting this close to the spindle, there isn't a huge advantage to angular contact bearings. Can deep groove ball bearings handle thrust load? Yes, of course they can. I've read they can handle up to half their rated load in pure thrust. Remember when a ball bearing is being thrust loaded, all of the balls are in contact, which means it's actually distributing the load quite evenly. When I do a video on bearings, I'm going to go into calculating the equivalent loads for bearings, which involve X and Y factors and things like that. I decided to use a needle bearing on the rear of the shaft. They can actually handle quite high forces at quite high speeds, and there are pretty big forces at the rear bearing due to leverage from the cutting force, and also pretty high belt tension. The other thing is the rear bearing has to move freely axially anyways, so this seemed like a pretty good choice. For the shaft material, I decided on 17.4 stainless, which is precipitation hardenable. I didn't end up hardening it because, again, the forces are so low relative to the size of the shaft, it's not a huge deal. And for the pulley, I'm going to use my new favorite, which is the J section. So this is a bit of a more detailed design I came up with. You can see what my preload method is going to be. I'm going to use a nut that pushes the inner race of the needle bearing, which in turn pushes on a sleeve, which in turn pushes on the inner races of the ball bearings. The ball bearings actually have 0.2 millimeters of shims on the outer race, and that forces the balls against opposing sides of their outer races, which acts as a, a preload which can be applied axially. You can see both the housing and the shaft can be cut in a single machining operation, which is going to be a big advantage for actually making these parts.
so this is how the shaft turned out. I gotta say, I'm super impressed with 17.4 stainless. It machines really nice and it's really easy to get a good finish. Uh, I hit all my tolerances, the threads all work, and I'm pretty happy with this part. Now that that's done, I've got some more boring parts to do. So I ordered the parts from McMaster Car and they arrived quite quickly. These are ABEC 3 bearings. I just didn't want to pay 10 times the price for ABEC 7 bearings. And these should work for this application. I've also got some precision needle roller bearings here and I ordered them with a liner so I don't have to 
harden the shaft at all. You have to be careful when you put these together to make sure the shaft liner isn't hitting the side of the roller when you're pressing it together. So this is how it goes together. Basically I'm taking one ABEC 3 bearing and I'm sandwiching shims in between it and the bearing behind it. Just gotta make sure the shims are clean before you put them on. And what I'm doing here is pinching the two inner races together and individually rotating the outer races. You can see that with just a single shim, the two outer races will rotate separately, which means they're not touching. So what I'm going to do is actually stack another shim in there. Now when I pinch the two inner races together, the two outer races are touching, so they rotate together as well. I didn't want a heavy preload, and this is just a good way of getting a really light preload. I'm not actually going to put these on the shaft here, but uh, you can see the journal where they're going to sit. That's a JS4 transition fit, so plus or minus uh, 10 microns, I think. And that's how the sleeve is going to go on. It's going to press through the inner race of the roller bearings, and I'm going to tighten it on with this nut. I can continue tightening the nut and press all the components up against the shoulder. And because I've shimmed the outer races, I can't actually increase the preload past a certain point. So that's good. Well, that's the spindle done. I'll see you guys next time for the head sock.